So I just realized that I guess at my age, uh, then you suddenly have presentations that have the word lifetime in it. Um, but don't worry, I'm not going to talk about my lifetime, um, and it should not be an indication of how long this presentation will be. Um, but I'm actually going to talk about lifetime value uh, in games. I know probably most of you did not get into gaming because of the money, uh, and in some studios it's even almost frowned upon to be uh, profitable, uh, because then you're like selling out or stump something. But in case you are not completely against being profitable, um, we have a couple of, so say, suggestions what you could do to improve that. And I think that uh, lifetime value, especially the lifetime part of that, is completely overlooked. Um, so that's why I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we did for that. Um, for those of you who do not mega, uh, know Mega Zebra, I'm going to just quickly say that we're based in Munich, in Germany. Um, we are profitable. We have been developing free-to-play titles for quite a while now. We are grouping them into two franchises, and um, while well, we do a lot of uh, analytics so that we can actually look at all the stuff that we're doing and see how well we're doing. Um, we are, as I just said, we are grouping our titles into franchises and at the last Casual Connect uh, in Tel Aviv I did a little bit uh, presentation on why franchises, the pros and cons of that. Uh, but today I'm not going to do that, just quickly highlighting them. So one of them is a little bit like the Saga franchise, so progression-based games. Does this actually work? Yeah, it does. So progression-based games. Um, you can see there's one more title coming out later this year. And then we have our second franchise, which is the Suburbia franchise, where we basically have story-driven games. And also there, there's still some stuff happening this year. So we are bringing out uh, new titles, but we're also uh, continuing to work on our older titles. And um, why we do that? I'm actually first going to talk a little bit about something that doesn't have to do with games, uh, boots. So, uh, because this is something I can actually also relate to because I wear boots and some of you might know this boot um, and this one you probably do not know. This one is from the current winter collection of some manufacturer. Uh, probably it's fashionable, I don't know, uh, but somebody thought this should be the current collection. And this boot is actually a boot that was developed 40 years ago. And since then, that one actually hasn't changed too much. It's still sold today. If you go into a Timberland store, you will still see that boot. It will probably not always be the best-selling boot that Timberland has for that season. But um, I think over the whole year, it's, and especially over the 40 years, it has sold a lot of, lot of shoes. So, something that I cannot relate to that much because I take my bike to work, uh, cars, um, but just to highlight what I'm trying to get at. So, this is a brand new BMW SUV, um, just came out, and the other one is a Land Rover that was developed, I think, 70 years ago. Um, 70 years ago, that car came out, hasn't changed too much, uh, perhaps different paint. But for this car, which just came out, there probably a couple of years ago, some people at BMW, they got together, they started thinking about, okay, what should the new model have? What will be cool by the time it's launched? What technology will be required to be in a car when it gets out there? They spend a lot of money working on that, prototypes. At some point, the car came out, big commercials everywhere, and then hopefully they were right and people bought the car. So, what does that have to do with game um, and why am I showing all that? Actually, um, a lot of stuff we do, uh, and that also applies to game, it has a little bit of a shark fin uh, way of behaving. So, a new game is started, so that means some bit but he pitches it internally to some committee uh, or a guy, and uh, then perhaps they do prototypes, they work on it, and they continue to work on it. At some point, they launch it, and as soon as they launch it, then marketing is going to spend a lot of money on getting the game up there, yeah, and that starts there. And at some point in the future, I don't know, 12 months or tw 24 man months, they shift 
some of the team over, they shift marketing over and uh, start a completely new game. So, by basically by then, hopefully they will have made back the money that they invested into that game and they will start a new game. So, how does that relate to lifetime? If we look at this formula, it's not really, this will not make your uh, studio profitable, yeah, because uh, if your lifetime value is higher than the effective CPI that you pay, um, you still need to pay people and rent and so on and so forth. But if you look at all the components, if you look at the effective CPI, there's a lot of stuff you can do around that. And probably here at the show, people will tell you that they can get a fantastic CPI if you just work with them. Um, you can try to build in virality into your game. You can do smart uh, campaigns. You can optimize the App Store. You can perhaps get featured if you are nice to Apple and Google. That is stuff that you can do for that one. Value, you can put a lot of stuff into the game that you think will create uh, more value for the user so that, that they will pay. You can do CRM, um, you can work on the balancing, you can put out new content. Um, but the other thing that you can do, and actually that is one that you can control a lot, is you can work on how long can a player actually play this game. And I'm going to show you why I think that is so important and why this is something that you control. You, because there you don't need an Apple, you don't need a, a marketing company to help you, you can do all that by yourself. This is the game from us that has been out there the longest. It's called Mahjong Trails. Um, as you can see, the first quarter that I have on here is Q1 2012. And this is the chart for the revenues for that game. And as you can see, traditionally, uh, as I said, most companies, they start shifting over resources after something like, like two years. So that would be probably here. But as you can see, actually the real money that we're making with this game, that's just starting when other people perhaps move away from a game. And obviously this is now a super profitable game uh, that helps us work on new projects and, uh, and finance a lot of stuff that we're doing. So this is for revenue de development. The next is revenue per user. Looks pretty much the same, so it continues to go up. The money that we're making uh, with every single user that is playing the game. And I'm just going to show you one more. Uh, this is the stickiness, kind of like DAU over MAU. Um, and also here you can see that people continue to come back even more often, although that game is so old. Yeah? And we're still doing marketing for this game, so you would perhaps assume that if you do marketing now and new users come into the game, they might think, oh, this game looks old. Um, but actually somehow they don't, because even the new users that we're getting into the game, they continue to come back more and more often. So this is actually something that if you build a game, um, think about how can I make a game that is potentially playable not only over two years, but over five years or even ten years? Because if you do that, you can be really, really profitable. And the amount of money that you can pay on acquiring users will be higher. Because obviously, I mean, over the last couple of years, our lifetime value has doubled uh, almost every year. So if you take that into account, then there's more money that you can pay on the CPI so you can grow your game faster. So, if you want to do that, how do you actually go there? Obviously, sometimes you can retrofit it, yeah? So you have a game and then it goes well and then you say, oh, okay, I'm going to make an evergreen title out of that. Um, but if you want to plan it from the beginning, there are a couple of things that we are doing internally to make sure that this happens, uh, or at least that the likelihood is higher, and, um, and that is, taking considerations for all these areas for a new game and how trying to build a long lifetime game affects those. Let's go through them all. So, for example, for the team. So you start putting together a team and then we tell the team, if the game is live, you will actually continue to work on it. It's not going to be handed over to a different team, to like a maintenance team. It will not be shifted off to 
some other countries, yeah, some companies do that, uh, that they uh, have another studio in, for example, India or somewhere else, and then they just shift the game as soon as it's live. No, it's the same people, the same game designer, the same producer, the same developers working on that team, uh, on that game as it goes forward. Um, obviously, there will be some changes, but fundamentally, it will be the same, same team. If that happens, you have to kind of like think about stuff for that team because everybody wants to develop as a person. Um, and, um, and that's why it is important that you also uh, take into consider uh, consideration the personal growth of the people in that team um, so that w they will also find it interesting to work on it because normally people will always think it's interesting to work on something new because uh, something new is sometimes cool. And another thing, never lose focus. Um, with this game, with John Trails, but also the other ones that we have after that, sometimes we felt, okay, now we're actually thinking too much about our new titles, yeah? Um, and then somehow we see some of the KPIs um, beginning to be a little bit stable, and then we actually have to focus again and make sure that we have a full commitment and also make that clear to the team that although the game has been out there, although it's continuing to grow, don't lose the focus. So that's about the team. The next one, um, don't go for short-term trends in terms of gameplay and genre decisions. If you want to do something that's playable for years and years, um, nothing against Flappy Birds, uh, but it's probably not something that will be played in 10 years from now. But there are a lot of genres out there that have been played for years. Yeah, Match 3, yeah, it used to be called something with Bejeweled, now it's uh, something with candy or cookie, who knows what it will be in uh, 10 years from now, but fundamentally a Match 3 or some other genres, they don't change. They are basically evergreen genres. Um, so go and try to pick those genres. Make sure that when you pick a genre, you don't end up with something that becomes like a content war. So. For example, a decoration game, um, yeah, if, to, if you want to keep that uh, for a long time, you have to throw a lot of content, uh, I know, whatever you are decorating a house or something, you have to throw houses and furniture and all that at the, at the user. So also that is not really ideal for an evergreen title. Create endless loops, yeah, stuff that can go on forever. When you start, try also to do prototypes for the end game or late game. Something that will be interesting for the users who have played the game for uh, 10 years or 5 years already. So that's for the, for the gameplay. Now, demographics and audience. Um, obviously you can choose uh, whatever audience you like. We are feeling um, happy with the ones we have right now. It's a little bit more female tilted. Um, but again, don't try to go after audiences that change rapidly. Um, what do I mean by that? For example, kids and teenagers. Yeah? If you are doing a game for kids and teenagers and you want them to play that for five years, well, normally when they are <laughs> have played the game for five years, they probably are no teenagers any longer. Yeah? So then they say, oh, I'm too old for this. Yeah? But if, you, if your audience starts at 25 and you acquire somebody there, then they can literally play until they're, I don't know, 75 or more. Uh, so, so don't go for something that is uh, changing constantly. We are ideally going for mass market, yeah, because then it's just a, a bigger, bigger audience that you, that you can go after. Uh, and even if then there are some shifts, you can still continue to, um, to have a good, good audience. Last but not least, um, on the technology and platforms. Also here, uh, pick technologies that don't change too rapidly or are currently declining. Yeah? So there are good platforms right now that you can go after, but some of them are perhaps declining, I don't know, like browser-based games. Um, so I wouldn't recommend those. I would go for something that is actually stable and has a, a good future. Um, use technologies that the mass market is familiar with. So at the moment, for example, I would try to avoid things like the Apple Watch or uh, virtual reality because there might be some things that are now not possible but later they are and then when that happens you basically have to change your game a lot uh, to, to fit that. Um, 
also, but that's a, there's a personal opinion, I would perhaps avoid volatile, like HTML5, yeah, sometimes it's hip, sometimes it's not. Um, I would also avoid super new ones like Lumberyard, um, go for something that is stable. Mm. And yeah, no niche technologies, nothing that only uh, targets early adopters, because most of your people will probably not be, because the early adopters, they will never play a game for five years, because that's just against their belief of being an early adopter. Um, so use technologies that is stable. And last but not least, try to build tools that help you add content later on very easily. Because once you have that, and you have a game that's out there for five years or something, and you have tools that let you add content and features very, very quickly, then you will have a very, very profitable game, because then you can have, so say, a, a good team, and that's also say, like a well-oiled engine. Um, so basically, that's already it uh, for now. Uh, and I think then afterwards, it's probably beer time. Uh, just quickly summing up uh, what I tried to get across. So. If you want to improve your profitability, um, work on everything, but do really look at the lifetime. Look at how long can people play this, um, because I think it's an incredible lever to increase the profitability. If you want to do that, um, you can either be lucky and just retrofit it, or you can think about it from the very get-go, before you start the development. Try to build modern classics like the Yellow Boot or the Land Rover Defender, and then ideally become profitable while you do that. Hi, thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, what kind of modeling do you use for your um, LTV in general? What kind of modeling do you use for LTV? So, what are the different proportions that you're using? Um, well, I mean, so, so basically for. Um, for some of the games uh, that that are already out there, actually there we we are basically looking at how much did money, uh, how much did the people play and pay so far, uh, and then from that we are using kind of like the the curves and try to kind of like put them over the new games to see how are they roughly on the same curve? Do we think they will hit the same uh, same LTV uh, as the others? Uh, and then kind of like we are adjusting that curve as we go along. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not super scientific, uh, but we're basically just plugging in the numbers we have. And every new number that comes in, we're using to, to adjust uh, the curve that we currently have. Uh, before that, uh, then I, I will have also one. Uh, when you saw that uh, rise in the revenue uh, for Mahjong Trails after two years, how did you react? Did you put uh, more people on that project or started to uh, push content updates or just continued what you did for that? Yeah, I mean, we, I would say we pretty much continued what, uh, what we did before. Um, just kind of like we knew more about the game uh, and basically did more of the stuff that we, we knew worked, but continued to try new things. So even with this game, I mean, at the moment, we, are, we have two different game design uh, tracks uh, looking at that game to see what new features can come in, uh, what is kind of like uh, something that is still missing in the game, uh, things that improve, so say, the, the long-term part of it, i.e. new content, but also looking at, okay, so everybody who has ever played it in the last five years and potentially left the game because they were stuck, how do we actually get them back? Is there something that, that they can play with even though they don't progress in the past? So, so many more things that we're putting into the game. Um, we're constantly updating the UI, the graphics of it, to make it kind of like look look state of the art, make it look fresh, uh, so it doesn't look, look outdated. Um, so it's actually more of all that, um, and continues to, to improve it, look at the numbers, and uh, talk to the, to the users. Um, the size of the team has been pretty stable from the very beginning. I mean, at Mega Zero, our teams are normally between um, eight and ten people, so actually very small teams per game. Um, for us, that is working very well, so th that has actually hasn't changed, uh, because I don't believe that just throwing more people at a game uh, will make it, make it better. Uh, if you have the right people, then a very small team will be very sufficient as well. 
Thank you very much. All right, man. thanks.